Looks like it's seven o'clock. Excellent. All right. Well, welcome folks. Uh, this is the March edition of the James B. Kaler Science Lecture Series. I'm Eric Johnson. I am the director of the Starco Planetarium at Parkland College. With me here is Waylena McCulley, the producer of our programming. And she, you can actually see, is in the dome tonight. So that's, uh, that's all the seats where you normally would be sitting behind her. Um, and then with us also is our lecturer for this evening, Jeff Bryant. Now I'm gonna let Waylena give the introduction for Jeff. And I think hopefully you folks, some of you might know why that's an especially appropriate thing to do, but I'm gonna leave it to Waylena because she's known Jeff far longer than me. All right, so Waylena, please take her away. All right, hi everyone. Yes, I'm here in the planetarium all by myself. So I can't wait for the day when we can have you all in here again. And um, after this talk, we'll have uh, my talk on exoplanets, but I can also show you a little bit of what we were originally planning for Jeff's talk when it was scheduled for last April. So uh, we'll hopefully be able to have him back here at, in the dome to be able to show you what we had in mind for that. So Jeff Bryant is originally from Anderson, Indiana, and he attended Ball State University for both his bachelor's and his master's degrees in physics. He did research in astronomy studying cataclysmic variable stars. And uh, during his time, he maintained hobbies in astronomy, photography, and outdoors. Now in 1999, he moved to Champaign to work for Wolfram Research. And um, then the next year met his wife, me, Waylena, who works here in the planetarium. Now to get away from the computer during breaks and weekends, he started macro photography as a hobby, which evolved into this hobby of photographing birds, which has just exploded and his photographs are wonderful. And I'm so glad that he is here with us to be able to share them today. So Jeff, you ready? Yep, I think so. All right, let's go ahead and All share right. your screen. Okay, give me just a second here. Let me get my, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> uh, let's see, share screen. There we go. Everybody see it okay? Okay. All right, hello everyone. Um, Glad everybody could be here. I uh, wish we could do this in person. As Waylena mentioned, we had originally planned on doing this actually in the dome and we had all kinds of really cool plans of putting all kinds of birds all around you to have a fully immersive experience. Unfortunately, uh, certain viruses have intervened and uh, we uh, have to resort to Zoom. So I had to alter the way I was planning to present this. So uh, my goal for this talk is actually going to be more about variety. It's not gonna be about details of any one kind of bird or anything like that. So it's gonna be kind of a, a whiz bang kind of presentation presentation of uh, a whole bunch of things. So um, uh, rather than get into any details of them, um, I'm hoping to go through as many pictures as I can uh, in, uh, during this talk and then at the end maybe open it up if people want to revisit any one bird or have questions about a particular bird and do that more at the end. But try to get through as many of my pictures as I can. I've got something like close to 240 pictures to get through, although I won't be showing them one at a time. So hopefully that'll make things go faster. So. Um, Anyway, as Waylena mentioned, um, I actually kind of moved here in 99 and had a hobby of um, kind of, I started with macro photography just to get me outside a little bit. I had had a, had a camera for astrophotography from years before and I started with that. And then of course the digital revolution came and uh, got my first digital camera and started taking pictures of flowers and bugs. Then that first winter came along and everything died. I didn't have anything to take pictures of macro photography wise. I guess I could have done snowflakes, but uh, I got kind of bored. And that's when I started pay paying attention to backyard birds. And I noticed that when I started paying attention to them, there was a lot more things in my backyard than I thought there was when I just had to look for them. Um, and so hopefully I'm going to give you kind of a broader sense of what you can see in your own backyard, but also just getting around the Champaign area. I don't know how, uh, what areas everybody here is from, but um, most of the birds you're gonna see here are from around the immediate Champaign County area. Um, but um, if you're in the Midwest, you're gonna have pretty similar views uh, and choices of birds to, to see. So um, with that, uh, uh, I'll get started here. You can see my title page here. Um, 
I've got an indigo bunting. This was actually taken uh, on the north side of uh, Champaign County. Um, I'll have this combined with some other birds later on, but uh, it's one of the prettiest birds that I have, and it's actually quite common. We've actually got this bird uh, here all summer, and it's one of the background songs that you hear uh, uh, singing in the trees if you go to the parks. You probably didn't even know that it was there. Uh, so anyway, the birds, um, you know, that I go to see, I, there's a couple ways you can see them. You can just use your eyes um, or you can use some binoculars. And those are honestly the best ways to do it. Um, telescopes, things like that, uh, you know, they're very narrowing. So if you try to use spotting scopes, you know, they're hard, to, they're cumbersome uh, to carry around. But binoculars, you just carry them around your neck and you just take a nice gentle walk through the park and you can see all kinds of things with just your eyes and a pair of nice binoculars. Um, I got into photography, not so much, uh, I didn't, wasn't interested in counting birds or things like that. I actually wanted to try to capture them and, and see their pictures. So um, I actually do have, for anybody that's interested, I use a Canon, the 7D Mark II. I have a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. Uh, it's an f5.6 uh, zoom lens. And I have a black rapid shoulder strap. So it's kind of a, it goes diagonally across me instead of around my neck. Uh, and you're carrying a several pound camera around the park for a couple hours. If you have just a neck strap, it tends to weight down and hurt a little bit. So I switched to something that goes around my shoulder. So um, anyway, so that's what I use. Um, some of the common birds that you probably have seen, if, especially for those of you that may have feeders in your backyard, we've got blue jays, Canada geese that everybody loves. <laughs> cardinals, state bird, and crows. May not seem very exotic. I actually think crows are kind of neat. They actually, uh, they're, they're all over the place, but if you get good views of them, they're actually very smart birds. And uh, we've actually seen them do uh, problem solving. Uh, here you can see one perched on our uh, suet cage in the backyard that we feed our birds. And I can tell that they've been back there because they, uh, they can't hang from the suet cage like the suet cage is designed for, for woodpeckers. So they actually pull them up and prop them up horizontally to actually get at the suet. So I can tell that they've been there. They uh, figured out how to solve that little problem. Uh, some more backyard birds, uh, downy woodpeckers. This is a more traditional bird you would see on a suet cage. Uh, we've got house finches that are red, gold finches that are yellow. You've got uh, house sparrows. These are not native, but they're all over the place. These are the birds, if you go to Myers or Walmart, you're probably gonna see some of these flying around inside the store. And of, uh, of course, you've got mallard ducks if you get anywhere near the water. And of course, robins. A lot of people think of these as some of the first birds that they see in the spring. In actuality, they're actually here year round. Uh, as long as there's some open water and places where they can get food, you can actually find robins in certain places here all, all, all the time. Uh, so they prefer to stay here if they can for food. Uh, they'll go after berries, anything that's left over over the winter. But as long as it's not too cold, you'll often see robins sticking around if you look for them. And with that, I think that's uh, that's all the birds I have to show. Uh, just kidding. Um, the, there's uh, these are these are the common birds that you're likely to see uh, if you're in a backyard, if you're in your backyard, or uh, you know just uh, casual viewing something like that. Um, but uh, there are additional birds that you can see in your feeders uh, and around at the parks. So I'll go into some uh, slightly more exotic birds that maybe you didn't notice. Um, blue grosbeaks. Um, these are not as common. I've only ever actually seen one of this, one of these, and I've seen this one down at uh, Lake Charleston. So that's another place that you can go. Lake Charleston has some good birds down there. Um, Carolina wrens, chickadees, juncos. Juncos are here right now. They're a winter bird. Dick thistles. This is another bird that's actually fairly common, but you usually have to get out away from town to see them. Uh, if you go out to parks uh, that are grassy, kind of near grassland areas and stuff like that, uh, you'll see dick thistles out there. They're another uh, kind of a summer sounding bird. Uh, the indigo bunting down below that uh, I showed earlier as part of the uh, um, title slide. House wrens. And this is a pine siskin. Pine siskins are often here in the winter. Actually, we had a good number of them come through this winter. Um, but they come through in bursts. Not every year you'll get them, but if they are here, they're usually here only in the winter. If you have thistle seeds, they often like uh, um, chopped up uh, sunflower seeds and thistle. If you get a mix of that, they often will come to feeders if you have that. Um, but they kind of look like a, a dirty a dirty goldfinch kind of. Uh, so they're easy to mistake, but if you look very carefully, they have these hints of yellow on their, on their wings, but are otherwise kind of a brownish looking bird. Uh, this is actually um, a purple finch. Looks very similar to the house finch, but it's a little bit less common. They'll come to feeders. We've got red-bellied woodpeckers. Even though the, the red is on the head, its whole head is not red. It actually does have a rusty spot on its belly, so that's why it gets its name. Um, we've got 
red-breasted nuthatches, and we've got rose-breasted grosbeaks. So we saw a blue grosbeak earlier. This is a rose-breasted grosbeak. Grosbeak, gross means big, so it's got a big beak. So that's where they get their name from. And it's got the, the males have the rose spot on their chest. All right, once again, we're still in the cardinal allies. So these are these are loose groupings. These are not scientific groupings. I, I, I tried to stick as much as I could, but uh, some, some birds I just had to kind of loosely group. So here we've got scarlet tanagers and summer tanagers. Uh, the difference main being, uh, mainly being, at least uh, during breeding season, uh, scarlet tanagers have black wings, summer tanagers do not. Um, you've got tufted titmouse or titmice and uh, white-breasted nuthatch. I showed you a red-breasted nuthatch before. Sparrows. <clears throat> a lot of people think of sparrows as being very boring birds. They're, 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 you know, they refer to them as the little brown jobs. You know, these are the little brown birds that often people see, but actually there's actually quite a bit of variety in sparrows. Um, sometimes you have to look close to see that variety, but it's there. Chipping sparrows. Uh, have that rusty red cap there. These are very common in the summer. You hear them quite often. They kind of blend in with the sound of cicadas. A very uncommon one. This is my best picture I have. I'm kind of in the phase where I'm trying to improve some of my pictures of some of these birds because they're not as common, so I have to make do with what I've got for now. This is a clay-colored sparrow. This was actually seen in Busey Woods, if anybody's familiar with that, behind uh, Carl Hospital. We've got a, uh, a towhee, an eastern towhee. Uh, and here we've got a, ooh, even I'm getting confused here. I gotta make sure I get my uh, sparrows right here. This is a, f a field sparrow. Most of these birds I know pretty well, but there's actually still a few that I, I, I get confused at if I'm not constantly looking at them. So uh, here in the winter, you can sometimes get fox sparrows. Uh, this picture doesn't really do it justice, but they have kind of a reddish brown color to them with a gray cap. And they kind of do stand out in the, in the kind of drab colors in the winter. The rusty brown is actually um, a little bit more orangish to my eyes anyway than even what this picture shows. So they do kind of pop when you see them. We've got a Lincoln sparrow here that has this kind of streaky and buffy breast. Savannah sparrows have this little faint eyebrow. Song sparrows, these are very common. You'll see these around all over the pl place. They have um, a black spot in the center of their chest usually. We've got swamp sparrows hanging around in kind of the more wetland areas typically, uh, although you can see them around at some of the other parks as well. We've got a, a, an American tree sparrow here. It's got the uh, kind of the yellow underside on its beak here and that rusty cap up there. A vesper sparrow and a white crown sparrow. So this is just sparrows. There's, there's quite a few sparrows that are uh, out there if you look for them, um, but you have to get used to it and you have to be on the lookout for them. And with time and practice, there's also a white-throated sparrow. I forgot I had one more here that's on its own here. It's got the nice, uh, these are pretty common in backyards and they actually have a pretty noticeable song in the early spring. Uh, so, um, and they got the white throat and then of course the yellow up by the eye there. Now, warblers. This is a very large group of birds. These are birds that most of you, unless you're a birder, probably have never noticed because they're very small. They hide out in shady areas and they eat bugs. They do not come to feeders usually. Um, there's rare exceptions to that, but in general, they don't come to feeders. Um, and they typically go where people are miserable. So they go to places where there's lots of mosquitoes, where it's kind of dark and shady, things like that. And it's kind of hard to get pictures of them because of that. They don't hang out usually in the best light. So warblers are kind of a challenge to get pictures of, but there's a lot of them. And they come through here every spring and fall during migration. And so they're some of the prettiest birds that you'll ever see coming through here. So if you're looking for them uh, and you have quick eyes, you might see some of these. So here we've got a male American red start. It's a black bird with kind of orange on its wings and on its sides, and especially along the inner edge of its tail here. We've got a black and white warbler down here at the bottom. I caught this in our backyard eating a moth. Violent lives of birds. <laughs> We've got a bay-breasted warbler. I don't usually see these too often in breeding plumage. I actually more often see these guys in the fall when they're very confusing. A lot of these birds look very different in the fall than when they come through in the spring. They're much prettier usually in the uh, spring when they've got their full breeding color on, and then they get very confusing in the fall. So uh, most of these pictures, I try to focus on what they look like in the spring. And then of course, you've got the, uh, this is one of my favorite birds here. This is actually the, uh, uh, um, 
oh my gosh, favorite bird and its name's already escaping me here. Um, Blackburnian warbler. Oh, so many birds. It looks like they've stuck their face in a Cheeto bag. So they're basically black and white, but their whole face and chin is, a, is actually a bright orange. Uh, they're really pretty. Uh, we've actually had pretty good luck in our backyard. About every year I'll have one singing in the trees. This is a black pole warbler. Not very descript. It's mainly black and white. A little hint of kind of a palish yellow on the wings. This is a male. Black-throated blue warbler. This is a, a bird that I want to see more of and I need better pictures of. This one's slightly motion blurred, but it's a, a bluish colored bird with a black throat. Kind of part of its face is black as well. And then you've also got not only a black-throated blue, but this is called a black-throated green warbler. Here you can see the black throat much better. Uh, but where it gets the green from, I don't know. All I can say is the combination of black and yellow somewhere in between there is probably green. So uh, at a glance, you might think it's green, but there's actually no green on that bird at all. You've got a blue winged warbler, another bird that I don't actually get too many opportunities to see, but they're really pretty if you see them. Very bright yellow with kind of a bluish gray wing. A little bit of a black mask that goes across their eye. Canada warblers, Cape May warblers, chestnut sided warblers. And then down here in the bottom right, this is actually a common yellow throat. This is one of the few warblers that sticks around here and actually nests all, all summer. A lot of these other birds, they just kind of pass through on their way up to Canada and they do nesting up there. A few of them do stick around and uh, the common yellow throat is actually one of them. So another, another song, if you've heard the song, you probably would recognize it. You might not have known what it was coming from. They're pretty shy, like most warblers. Golden winged warbler, once again, eating a bug. It's got a little golden stripe on its wing here. We've got a hooded warbler. This is more common in the southeast, but occasionally we'll get them coming up here. Got this one in Busey Woods. Kentucky warbler. This one I think I got down in Charleston. Um, and here we've got a, uh, uh, let's see, this is a northern water thrush. Not the best picture, a little bit blurry, but um, I've never been able to get real close to them to get super good pictures. So, no, actually, I take that back. I think this is a Louisiana water thrush. I need to, to be absolutely sure on these. There's two different water thrushes that come through. There's a Louisiana water thrush and a Northern water thrush, and they actually look very similar. And I actually may have mislabeled some of my pictures. So this is some work I need to do. I need to actually get better at ide identifying the two, but they both look very similar. Kind of the difference is mainly in the eyebrow um, and how thick it is. So I've labeled this one as a Louisiana water thrush, but um, uh, Northern water thrush actually nests here. Um, Magnolia warbler. This is a morning warbler with a little black bib that it's got here. Got a Nashville warbler. It's got kind of a white eye ring and a very lemony yellow breast. And this is the Northern Perula. It's a, this one here is also here all summer. It does nest here. Um, very pretty. And actually I've had more luck with Northern Perulas than anything else. They're more likely to come down low and sing in my face than any other warbler. So this is one of my best pictures that I've been able to get. Here's the one that I've labeled as the Northern Water Thrush. Looks very similar to the Louisiana. Like I said, it's mainly the eye, the eyebrow here uh, that uh, will you know, mainly be the separating factor. I myself am not an expert. So that's either a Northern or a Louisiana. I'm not positive. Um, let's see, here we've got a, uh, an oven bird down here in the bottom left and a palm warbler here on the bottom right. And then up here, this is the uh, orange crowned warbler. So that actually looks very similar to another bird that we've got here. We've got a pine warbler, a prairie warbler. We've got a um, Tennessee warbler here on the bottom right. And then um, a prothonotary warbler. That's an interesting mouthful. Uh, these are, they tend to hang around wet areas. So if you know of like ponds, especially those deep in woods and stuff like that, you're more likely to see them around there. Um, very bright yellow birds. They're, they're just brilliant when you see them in the park. These are all insectivores, by the way, for the most part. They, uh, they go where the bugs are. So they won't come to your feeders. We've got a, um, a Wilson's warbler. It's got the little black cap on its head, yellow otherwise yellow rumped warbler because of the yellow rump that it's got. We've got, I'm talking about a lot of individual birds. I'm not giving much background on them, so I'm trying to go through them kind of quick because of all the birds we've got. We're still in warblers. We have a lot more birds to go. Uh, this here is actually, uh, uh, used to be called a sycamore warbler because they actually uh, uh, kind of 
tend to prefer them, or at least that was the perception, uh, but they've actually been kind of renamed and now they're just called a yellow-throated warbler. Yeah, for obvious reasons, it's got a yellow throat. Uh, here's a yellow warbler. The males tend to have this red streak on them. Yellow, uh, the females are a little bit more bland than this, but uh, these, are, these guys are here pretty much all summer. They, they nest here. So that was a lot of warblers. I mean, that's, and that's not even all of them. There's a few that I have not yet seen. They tend to be not as common around here, but there's still some that I'm looking for, but there's quite a bit. Vireos uh, come through kind of at the same time as the, uh, the warblers do as they're migrating through in the spring and again in the fall. We've got a blue-headed vireo. Used to be called a solitary vireo, but um, blue-headed is what I know it, know as, know it as. Um, we've got the um, um, uh, red-eyed vireo here down on the bottom left. A warbling vireo here in the bottom right. This is in a, uh, a blossoming tree uh, in uh, Crystal Lake Park, actually. It just popped up just at the right time. So uh, posed perfectly in the middle of a blooming tree in the spring. So uh, it's one of my favorite pictures, even though it's a very bland looking bird overall. And then up here is a Philadelphia vireo. White-eyed vireo for obvious reasons. It's got the white eye iris. I've actually seen a few of those. They're actually quite uh, territorial. And the ones that I've come up to, they, they tend to jump right out in front, kind of cuss at you a few times, singing loudly, and then they disappear. Um, and we've got a yellow-throated vireo here too. So there's a few vireos, not as many as there are warblers that come through. There's also a bell's vireo. That's a vireo that I've personally not yet seen myself. So that's something on my to-do list, uh, another vireo that does appear in the area. Let's see. Uh, let's see. So herons and egrets. So we don't see as many of these unless you get near water. Uh, herons and egrets tend to do a lot of wading, so you need to be in areas where there's going to be a lot of water around. So shallow water typically. Um, so areas around town like, for example, uh, Kaufman Lake often attracts herons. Um, no, I, I don't think I've ever seen any egrets at Kaufman Lake, um, but uh, if you know St. Joseph wetland, if you get on 150 and head east towards St. Joseph, right before you get to town on your left, there's a wetland area there that's actually quite nice. I've actually seen great egrets there, big white birds. They look like um, uh, great blue herons, but they're pure white. So let's take a look at some of those. Oops. So here's a black crowned night heron. This is a picture I got actually at Robeson Park here on the southwest side of uh, town of Champaign. Uh, this is the only picture of a cattle egret that I've ever had. On the, uh, this was out uh, south of town, actually uh, taken from the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society uh, uh, dome. Actually, uh, one year we had a really wet spring and this was shooting way across a flooded field and it was uh, just sitting there on the other side. It's got a little bit of a tan mohawk, a little bit of tan uh, on its... Uh, hindquarters here and a little bit on its breast, but uh, that's the only one I've ever seen in the area. Uh, they're not as common around here. Great blue herons are actually fairly common. Uh, interestingly, when I first got into, before I even officially got into birding, we'd be driving around town and I would see these guys in ditches and I would call them ditch birds because I didn't know what else they were. Uh, so um, I've learned some since then. So uh, this is a great blue heron. These are actually quite common and they're, they're actually all around the uh, the U.S. just about. I mean, they're 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 quite numerous. Uh, great uh, egret over here to the right has a similar body structure, a little bit skinnier in the neck, but it's pure white. And actually, when they spread their feathers out, they're just they're so beautiful when they spread out their feathers. Uh, they've got a cool pattern to them. They're very fine. Um, I've only seen that a few times, but uh, it's neat when they spread their uh, feathers out. Green herons. These are actually pretty common. They're about the size of a crow but they're actually very sneaky and they like to hide. But if you, even if you live in town and you're, you're like at an apartment complex that has a little pond, sometimes these guys will be creeping along the edge looking for any kind of little fish or minnows or anything like that that are in the water. Um, they're very smart birds. I've actually seen videos of the, online where they actually fish. People have thrown birds at, at one of the, or I'm sorry, thrown bread at one of these. It grabbed the bread and, and then it took the bread and didn't eat it, but it took it out and threw it out on the water to attract fish. And then it would actually, use those as lures and it would then eat the fish. So they're actually a very smart bird. Um, I've seen these guys, uh, you can see just a hint of the green and the wings, uh, but it, they actually look more uh, kind of purplish brown and blue. But if you hit, the light hits it just right, you see a green iridescence that shows up in their feathers. We've got little blue heron. Now this one here, that's confusing as a name here. It, it's white here. That's because this is a juvenile. Um, but when they grow up, they actually get kind of a 
a bluish color all over, kind of like the wings of a green heron here, but it's all over. I've never seen an adult. So the only picture I have is this juvenile. This was taken down near Lake Charleston. Snowy egret looks very similar to the juvenile uh, little blue heron. Uh, but if you look very closely, it's got yellow here near its eye. That's kind of a telling mark. Also, the feet are different. Can't really see the feet of the bird up here, but um, um, I usually look for the uh, yellow near the eye to tell the two apart if I see them. This one uh, is a yellow crowned night heron. We saw a black crowned night heron earlier. Um, let me just back up real quick. So here's the black crowned night heron. You can see it's got the black crown up here on its on the top of its head. It's kind of a bluish color. Yellow crown, you don't see it as well right here, but it's actually kind of like a white mohawk instead of a dark, so it's like the reverse. Um, this one was taken at uh, Kaufman Lake actually a couple years ago. So those are all my herons and egrets. Um, we've also got a number of wading birds. This is a, another very confusing group of birds. Uh, these are a challenge for me and they're not ones that I'm experts in by any means. I have to be reminded every time I see them which ones they actually are. Um, and sometimes it's hard to actually get a, an isolated picture. Sometimes you get them in a group like in the bottom right here where you get a mix of birds. So um, the birds you see up here are called American avocets. These were actually taken actually uh, at the swine farm near the Yahoo offices, uh, close to the research park, uh, if anyone's familiar with the U of I campus there. Uh, there's actually a swine farm with a pond that actually attracts a surprising number of uh, wading birds um, um, uh, during the migration season. And I actually got a pair of them that land and they've got this interesting little upturned beak. You've got black necked stilts down here on the bottom left. It's got this little black neck up here and they, they're actually quite noisy. They do a lot of peeping noises, very high pitched peeping when they're uh, uh, walking around out here. This was also taken out near the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society Dome a few years ago during a, a, a wet spring. American golden plover in the upper right, got this kind of gold speckliness on their back. And then down here we've got um, dowichers, which are the kind of the reddish looking birds. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think these are black-bellied plovers. Um, let me just remind myself real quick on that one to make sure I don't have that mixed up with a different bird. Uh, let's see here. I'm sorry, those are dunlins. Dunlins. So the dunlins are the ones with the black bellies there. There is a black-bellied plover. I don't remember if I've got pictures of that one or not. Um, but these are dunlins with the black, uh, the black spot on the belly and then uh, a bunch of dowagers down here. There's actually a long-billed dowager and a short-billed dowager. There, that's another bird I have a really hard time telling apart, and I have to kind of take it, you know, I have to ask other people for help uh, as to which one it is and take their word for it. We've got, um, uh, we've got, uh, 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 I think this is a, this is a yellow legs, um, very unique name. Uh, it's just known for <laughs> the color of its legs, which are very yellow. There's a lesser and a greater. Um, they look very similar. Uh, size, if you see them next to each other, is the easiest way to tell them apart, but there are more subtle ways to tell them apart. Um, a godwit, this particular one is a Hudsonian godwit. Uh, this one was actually not taken locally. This was actually taken across the border in Indiana. It's the only one I've ever seen. It's a pretty uncommon bird around here, but um, it draws attention when one gets sighted. Um, an ibis. This particular bird is a juvenile, so it's either a glossy ibis or a white-faced ibis. But when they're this young, there is no way to tell them apart short of a genetic analysis. They look so similar that uh, when they're in this phase that it cannot be positively identified. So this is the only one that I've seen, but I can't tell you whether it's a white-faced ibis or a uh, glossy ibis. And then of course, killdeer. Many of you have probably seen killdeer. They're very noisy. If you go anywhere near a golf course or anywhere there's lots of grass in the summer, uh, these guys will nest. They're famous for, uh, if they've got a nest, they'll uh, try to lure you away by doing the fake broken wing and they'll kind of limp away and try to get you away. Um, but they're also very noisy. We've got a least sandpiper. Here's the, uh, the other yellow legs. The other one before was a greater yellow legs. This is the lesser yellow leg. Here we've got the, um, this, is a, this is the other, I, I showed you a dowager before, kind of in that group with the uh, Dunlins. This is a close up of one of the dowagers. Uh, I think this is a long billed dowager. And then here we've got a uh, marbled godwit. So before I showed you a Hudsonian godwit, this is a marbled godwit notice that the feathers are kind of marbled in their pattern. This was actually taken um, pretty far southwestern 
Champaign County a couple years ago. I actually went with a, a birder friend of mine, Deanna, up off. Uh, the two of us went out there and drove out and found it. Here we've got a, um, another type of sandpiper. This is actually a, um, a pectoral sandpiper. Sandhill cranes, not real common around here. They actually have a migration path that takes them through Northwest Indiana down on their way to Florida and, and points south. Um, but I did get lucky a couple years ago and a couple of them flew over uh, when we were just finishing up a bird walk in BC Woods. So we came out and four of them flew over and I got a picture of a couple of them as they were flying over. Uh, we've got a semi-palmated plover down here on the bottom left. At a glance, you might think that it's like a, you can see coloring, it's very similar to the killdeer that I showed you before, but it's got a much shorter beak, um, a very kind of dwarfish looking bird by comparison, but a similar color pattern. And here you can see another, let's see, semi-palmated, that's the, um, I think that's the short-billed dowager, I believe. Checking here real quick. Yes. Got a solitary sandpiper. It's got this white ring around its eye, very well-defined white ring. A Sora. This is a bird that's very secretive. You got to go to a wetland area typically to find them. They like it really swampy and wet. Um, so if you don't have one nearby, you may never see them. And even if you do have one of those areas, you may never see the bird because uh, it takes some effort to get them to come out and actually photo, uh, cooperate. Um, spotted sandpiper for obvious reasons. You can see the spots all over its chest. They do nest here in the summer. This is the only one of these I've ever seen. This is an upland sandpiper. So these actually, um, um, I actually saw this once again at the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society out behind the dome one time and it surprised me and I, it was running away by the time I real, realized it was there. Here we've got a Virginia rail. I saw this north of Danville at Heron, uh, Heron County Park. Um, We've got a willet, so a pretty good sized wading bird. And of course, this is a picture that my wife Waylena actually took out of our car window. This is actually a Wilson snipe. If you've ever heard of the snipe hunt, snipes are real birds. They do really exist. They do blend in, they flush very easily. You're more likely to, uh, if you're walking near a wetland area or a muddy area during the spring, uh, you're more, more likely to spook a bunch of them and they'll fly off and scare you. I've had that happen several times. And they make a lot of noise when they fly off, but they've got this bizarre looking long beak. Uh, there's a bird that looks very similar to it that's actually getting active right now called a woodcock. They actually are closely related. Um, in fact, sometimes the woodcock is known as the woodland snipe. And, um, but uh, they look very similar. Woodcock are coming through right now and they actually make a lot of noise. Usually uh, right after sunset, uh, they get no uh, noisy and they'll probably be offering some uh, well, I don't know what the COVID going on. They would normally have a, uh, a woodcock walk to try to take people out and hear them or see them, but I don't know if they're going to do that this year with the uh, COVID going on. All right, so a lot of those waiting birds, they're pretty confusing. There's a lot of them. Uh, keep in mind, this talk is going to be recorded, so if anybody wants to go back and look at these, they can. Um, and you're not meant, there's no test afterwards. You're not meant to try to ID these uh, afterwards. It's, it's, I've been doing this for about 10 years, and even I'm not an expert at this yet. There are people that are far more practiced at this than I am. Um, uh, these are actually called American Coots. There's actually a group of these hanging out at Kaufman Lake in Champaign as we speak. They've been out there for the last week. There was about four of them. Me and my wife drove out there just the other day and saw four of them. Uh, they're very interesting toes. I didn't post the picture in here because I just took it about a week ago, but uh, they have some of the coolest looking toes you've ever seen on any bird. Um, but uh, often you'll see them swimming, not walking. So uh, I was there lucky enough when there was still some ice. We've got Ameri excuse me, American white pelicans. Uh, I've only seen these a couple times. They typically prefer bigger bodies of water. So uh, this one here was actually, surprising, surprisingly, this was over by Muhammad in a small little neighborhood pond. It actually attracted, I think there was like three or four of them. And I got one of them as it was flying. So um, American white pelicans do pass through this area. Um, like I said, if you're near like Lake Charleston or some bigger body of water, you're more likely to see them if you're out there at the right time. Um, here you can see some uh, some ducks out here. They're, they're not real. This is a bird that I want to get better pictures of. These are called American Wigeons, W-I-G-E-O-N. Um, this is a type of duck. There's a mallard here off to the left, uh, but a group of four wigeons. We've got a blue winged teal. You can see just a little bit of the blue on its wing. You can see it more when they take off and they fly. Got a very cool leopard print side to them in their chest. 
buffle heads. This is a male and a female. So the male here on the right, they've got this kind of big white patch on the back of its head. They're a very small diving duck. Uh, the female has these kind of white back cheeks. We've got a cinnamon teal. This was actually seen. Um, there's an area just southwest of Champaign. If you know where Carl at the Fields is, um, it's actually along Curtis Road. There's a church nearby there. And it's just west of that church. There's a flooded cornfield every spring assuming there's enough rain to flood. Uh, and it actually tr attracts a surprising number of ducks, interesting ducks, and waders. So if those are birds you're looking for, that's a good area to try to go through. You have to be careful though, traffic's been picking up there and there's not real good pull-offs. So be very wary of that. Uh, but often those water areas are real close to the road, so you often don't even have to get out of your car to see them. So this is a cinnamon teal that was seen out in that area. Got a common golden eye here on the bottom right, once again, taken at the swine farm over by the Yahoo offices in town. This here is a canvas back, a couple buffalo heads in the distance here, one in the near ground and one in the background. Uh, canvas back here, it's uh, got its wings spread out there. This was actually taken in Rantoul. I think it's called Lake Maplewood, I think. It's right along Maplewood Avenue, I think. Common merganser. Um, Mergansers have these kind of long, they almost look toothed if you, if you get a good shot of them. They almost have these uh, little sharp teeth looking things in their beaks. Uh, this is the only common merganser I've personally ever seen and it was a female taken around 2014. So I hadn't really been active in birding very long when I first saw this. This was at the pond at first in Windsor in Champaign. We've got a uh, double crested cormorant. We've got a gadwall down here in the bottom left. And this is a greater scalp. I don't see these as often. There's also a lesser scalp that's much more common mixed in with some redheads and some mallards. And yes, they're just called redheads. They're just redhead ducks, not a fancy name. We've got greater white fronted geese. These uh, actually are, I had a flock of these fly over my house last weekend. Uh, they actually sound like a pack of chihuahuas flying overhead. Uh, they actually sound different than Canadian geese. They still sound kind of like a honk, but imagine raising the pitch of the honk up to where it sounds like flying chihuahuas. And that's kind of what it sounds like. And it's got a green winged teal. I showed you a blue winged teal earlier. This is green winged. A hooded merganser. I showed you the common merganser earlier. Here we've got a couple of, uh, these are not, um, these are grebes, but they're, uh, um, Trying to remember which grebe it is. It's not not the eared grebe. That's I don't. That's a there's a bird called a, an eared grebe that I haven't yet seen. Let's see here. This is the uh, horned grebe. Excuse me. Sometimes I get caught up and I can't remember the names of these birds and it escapes me. Uh, this is a horned grebe and here you can see the two of them doing kind of a little mating dance that they were doing actually in the spring. This is once again in Rantoul, and uh, I got them actually kind of like doing an interesting dance in the water. It was really cool. This is a lesser scalp. I showed you the greater scalp earlier. I'll just back up real quick so you can see it. Here's the greater scalp. It has this very rounded, almost flat looking head. And the lesser scalp, it's a little bit more pointed up at the top. So you have to get a good look at the two scalp to tell them apart. But lesser scalp are far more common in this area. Long tailed duck. This was seen actually at the corner of Mattis and 150. There's a little building there, not far from the post office there that has a pond out in front of it. And um, this duck decided last, spring, it was pretty cold out and uh, hung out there for several days, uh, almost a week, I think. A mute swan. Uh, see these around? This one was taken at Heron Park, uh, north of Danville. And actually, is that, let's see here, what do we've got here? I'm trying to remember which one this one is here. I'll make sure I didn't get my uh, ducks mixed up here. I need to get my ducks in a row. Um, These are northern pintail, but these are not very good ones. Um, I've actually got better pictures that I didn't incorporate. That's what threw me off. These are not the best pictures that I have. Um, I've got uh, some better northern uh, pintails uh, taken just in the last couple of weeks. Um, very, very gorgeous, especially the males. If you see them, they've got kind of a long pointy tail. This is a northern shoveler. Uh, these are actually very cool. You know, at a distance, you'd think that they're a mallard, but if you look, they've got, got these really prominent long bills. It doesn't even, this picture doesn't do it justice. Uh, they actually look like they've got a shovel bill. Um, much bigger than a mallard if you see them side by side. Uh, but if you look up close, their coloring is different, but there's some, some similarities there. Pied-billed grebes, these are common here. We get them all through the summer. Very small little diving bird. It is not a duck, it's a diving bird. Got a red-breasted uh, merganser. I believe this is a female. 
So sometimes the color doesn't come through, especially if it's a female, but uh, this was at Kaufman Lake. Red-headed ducks, I showed some of those in a, a composite picture earlier uh, where you had some other ducks. So these are redheads again. Got a ring-necked duck. You don't usually see the ring. You can see a hint of it here, but sometimes uh, if you get them in the breeding season, you'll see the ring. Sometimes people will call them ring-billed ducks because the, the, the ring around the base of the bill stands out more, but uh, they're uh, more commonly called a ring-necked duck. Here you can see a Ross's goose. You can see how little it is compared to a Canada goose. Uh, and then down here you see a snow goose. So snow geese and a Ross's goose look almost identical. About the only way to tell them apart is their size. One's about the size of a mallard, the other's the size of a normal goose. Uh, and here you can see what's called a uh, ruddy duck, R-U-D-D-Y, a ruddy duck, very small little diving duck. This is a rare bird in this area, but it's actually a, uh, it's called a scoter. They're basically, think of them as sea ducks. Uh, they're more common as you get near uh, ocean areas and stuff. But every now and then, one will fly into the area and, uh, during migration when it's uh, kind of gone off course. And this one's actually taken in uh, Urbana on one of the small little apartment complex ponds. Um, this actually is a uh, um, surf scoter, I believe. Um, here we've got some uh, trumpeter swans. And down here to the bottom left is a tundra swan. This tundra swan was just taken, I took this picture about two weeks ago. We still had snow on the ground from uh, that big snowstorm that we had there. They look very similar to the trumpeters. It's hard to tell in the picture because it's so badly backlit, but it's got this little yellow area right near the eye, which actually shows up better if you zoom into the picture. Um, but uh, that's the only tundra swan I've ever seen. So I'm still finding new birds. It's just getting harder. Wood ducks. These are some of the most gorgeous ducks we have in this area. Um, you'll often see them up in trees. They actually nest in little boxes that people will often put up or, or tree holes. Um, but um, the males are just absolutely gorgeous with this crest that they have here. Very shy, it's hard to get very close. Uh, very few pictures I have of, with this much detail on it because uh, they tend to be very shy compared to mallards. All right, so this is another loose grouping. These are just some kind of miscellaneous woodland birds that we have in this area here. How are we doing on time here? I feel like I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm gonna have to speed up here, aren't I? Wow. All right. So there's a lot of birds here. Um, so we've got cuckoos. There's actually two different types in this area. This is a black billed cuckoo. Uh, I've got uh, blue gray gnat catchers, eastern bluebirds, and gray catbirds. We have another cuckoo in the air that looks almost identical. It's got a yellow bill. I'll show a picture of that in a minute. Uh, we've got gray-cheeked thrush. Notice it has these kind of gray cheeks. We've got a hairy woodpecker that's similar to the downy woodpecker I showed back like on one of the very first slides that shows up in your backyard. They just have a much longer bill. Pileated woodpeckers or pileated. I'm not quite sure what the right pronunciation. I've heard both. I usually say pileated. Um, and then here you've got a Swainson's thrush with this kind of buffy eye ring around its eye. This is a viri. It's another type of a thrush. It's got kind of a cinnamon brown color with very faint spots on its, on its chest. Um, here we've got a winter wren. Down below is a wood thrush. And here you've got a yellow-bellied sapsucker. Sounds like something that uh, you'd hear from uh, Yosemite Sam on the cartoons in the morning or used to in the morning anyway. I don't know if you can see much Yosemite Sam anymore. But if you look at trees often, especially in the spring, if you see a horizontal line of holes like you can see right here, also up here, you see that? That's typically the behavior you'll see of a, of a yellow-bellied sap sucker. What they'll do is they'll punch holes and then they'll come back and they'll lick up the sap, let the sap leak out. Here's the yellow-billed cuckoo. Um, so it looks very similar to the black-billed cuckoo. It's just a different pose here. And you can see it's got yellow underneath its bill. All right, flycatchers, swifts and swallows. You got barn swallows. We've got Eastern Phoebes. We've got Eastern Wood Peewees. This is a family that I got actually in um, Meadowbrook Park here a couple years ago with the mama here on the left and then had three uh, youngsters that were still hanging out nearby uh, posing for a family photo. And we've got a great crested flycatcher here. Um, I've got this labeled as a Northern rough winged swallow and I think that's what it is. I could be wrong that it could be a female of another type but I think this is a Northern rough winged swallow. So that's what I've got it labeled as. Um, this is an olive-sided flycatcher, not a very common bird, so it's kind of exciting to catch one of these in this area. They've got this kind of dark vest uh, when they perch. Um, tree swallows have this cool iridescent blue, and this is a yellow-bellied flycatcher. 
a lot of these fly catchers, especially like the ones on this bottom right, it's really hard to separate these birds. They look almost identical and you pretty much have to listen to their call to ID them. And I am not good with calls. So there are some people that know calls really well. I am not one of those people. So I will often need help if I see one of these in the field. It often takes uh, you know, a lot of analyzing the picture closely afterwards um, or being with other people that can identify her. Raptors, exciting birds. Um, so here we can see, this is one of my favorite birds. We have these, especially in the winter. I think they're here all year round, but I see them mostly in the winter because they perch out on the power lines. These are actually North America's smallest falcon. This is actually a small little bird. They're about the size of a, a you know, a blue jay or a, a, you know, a robin, but they'll perch up, up on power lines by themselves and then they'll go after mice in the fields. They're actually called um, um, kestrels, American kestrels. Bald eagles. These are becoming more and more common in the area. We've actually got some nesting down in Savoy. And there's actually something like four nests in Champaign County. Uh, so they're actually around if you look for them. Barred owls. This here is actually, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Uh, this is actually a broad-winged hawk. This is one that um, my wife actually saw on the way home from work one day. She came home and said, there's a cool looking hawk I've never seen before. We have to go see it. So we got in the car, zipped back, and luckily it was still perched. And I got this picture right before a lady walked by me with her dog and scared it off. So it was perched on a power line uh, right at the corner of Mattis and Duncan Road. Cooper's hawks. If you have backyard feeders for birds, you've probably seen one of these. These tend to, uh, you know, if you feed the little birds, you're going to feed the big birds too. They will come to your feeders. They will take your uh, take care of the little bird problem. Um, Northern screech owls, or I'm sorry, eastern screech owl. Uh, this is a friend of ours who built this wood duck box on his property up in Gibson City, and a couple years later, uh, screech owls came in, and they have babies every year in it. Great horned owl, long horned owl. They look very similar from a glance, but Longhorned owls actually are much smaller. They're kind of a skinny looking bird and they actually have much longer tufts on top of their head. This is actually called a, um, a Merlin, M-E-R-L-I-N. It's a small little falcon. Uh, we actually had one in um, Woodlawn Cemetery actually that was pretty well behaved. It was hanging around there uh, uh, earlier this uh, winter. This is a bird I've only ever seen once. This is a Mississippi kite. This is a Northern Harrier. Uh, these, you don't see these very much in Illinois anymore because everything's been turned into cornfields, but they were kind of a grassland bird and they typically, uh, they have a face that almost has eye discs like an owl and they're, uh, they'll actually uh, kind of partially hunt by sound and they use those, uh, those eye discs on their eyes to actually almost like sonar to bounce back so they can hear the mice better and uh, they've got a noticeable white rump and they flow, fly very low to the ground. Um, the males are often called gray ghosts because they have a very, this is a female here, but uh, um, they're very cool to watch. This is a uh, northern sawit owl. Homer Lakes had some of these recently. Uh, very small, about the size of a softball. An, an osprey. This guy was actually hanging out at Kaufman Lake a couple years ago. Uh, put on quite a show, constantly fishing. We've got a uh, peregrine falcon. Uh, there's actually one that hangs out every winter over on U of I campus. I've not ever seen that bird, even though it's at U of I, because I don't hang out at the U of I and I don't know where to go to look for it. Other people do. Uh, this one was actually taken in my hometown of Anderson, Indiana. Um, there's actually several of them that are now hanging out in downtown Anderson. Uh, they actually fight over the nesting areas. Prairie falcon, an uncommon bird for this area, more common out west. Uh, there's one. Uh, there's a stump out in the middle of uh, Coles County, two counties south of here, that every winter uh, they, a pair of them comes back and will uh, actually hunt out there. Um, this is actually a... Uh, um, I'm forgetting my hawks again. Uh, uh, Red-shouldered hawk. Takes me a second sometimes to get these in. Uh, this was taken down uh, in Coles County, Lake Charleston. red tail hawks, very common. Rough-legged hawks, they have these kind of, their legs are covered by feathers all the way down, so you don't usually see their shins. That's why they're called rough leg. These are a northern Arctic bird that will sometimes come down here. Uh, they're actually related to red tail hawks, but they're a different uh, species. <laughs> Uh, this here is a sharp shinned hawk. Looks very similar to a Cooper's hawk, but they tip typically are smaller. And they're, uh, if you see them next to each other, there's some other pointers. But a uh, short eared owl uh, in the winter, sometimes they'll come down and hang out low in the uh, cornfields. Snowy owl. We actually had a very well behaved one uh, uh, this last, uh, this, this winter, actually hanging out south of Sydney. Um, and it actually was there for at least a month and would just hang out along this same country road and would uh, be flying out there to attract a lot of people. 
swallowtailed kite, not a common bird for this area, but we actually had one about a block from our house a couple years ago, and it just fl flew around eating dragonflies out of the air. It attracted people from Chicago, drove down to Champaign to see it, and uh, northern nor normally they hang out in uh, Florida, so it was unusual to have a bird like this flying around. Um, so those get birders really excited when you get unusual birds showing up in the area. All right, so that was all my raptors. We're on to icterids now, kind of an odd name for a group of birds. Uh, but it includes things like Baltimore Orioles, bobolinks, have this kind of white mohawk on the back of their head, brown-headed cowbirds, meadowlarks, eastern meadowlark in this case. There's a western, but I've never seen one. Grackles, common grackles, orchard orioles, Red-winged blackbirds, these have actually just started showing up in the last couple of weeks. So if you're driving out near the edge of town and you see uh, reeds sticking up or sticks, they will often perch there. Um, rusty blackbirds, not super common. Uh, they used to be more common than they are now, but um, uh, they're another type of blackbird that can be seen. And then we've got some miscellaneous birds, um, kind of wrapping things up, getting in the last section here. So. Uh, We've got a belted kingfisher. This was actually nominated here recently as uh, U of I's uh, kind of uh, their new uh, mascot, if you if you will. Um, they, they, they are around here. They are common if you're in the right areas. You've got to be near water. They do like to fish in water and they're very noisy. You're more likely to hear them than you are to see them because they do not like to be watched. I have had the hardest time getting pictures of these birds because they know they're being watched and they will fly away as soon as you get your camera out. Um, but they're very pretty if you get to see them. They've, the females have this red rusty uh, band and they have kind of the U of I colors here. So you get the blue and the blue and the orange here. Males uh, have a belt too, but it's blue in their case. So it's the females that actually have the uh, rusty band. A brown creeper. Uh, here I've got a uh, um, um, brown thrasher, another cool bird, very songbird. Uh, I think they're related to mockingbirds, but I'm not positive about that. I don't know if I've got a mockingbird in this uh, album. I don't think I included that. Haven't seen too many of those. Um, um, but brown thrashers have very elaborate songs. Uh, very cool bird. Cedar waxwings are gorgeous. They will often go to fruit trees and eat berries and stuff. Um, um, if you ever see them, but they're typically a treetop bird. So even though they're fairly common, uh, you often will not realize they're there. They have a very high pitched song or call that honestly, if you're getting older and you're starting to lose your, uh, your hearing, this, is, this high pitched sound is the first sounds you will um, lose. So you can often tell if somebody's an old birder if they can no longer hear uh, cedar wax wings. Um, but gorgeous little birds. They almost look like a cardinal with very cool markings. It looks like their wings are dipped in wax, which is why they're called wax wings. Their tail has yellow on the tips of it and their wings have red. We've got um, a couple of birds like this. I've never seen a whippoorwill, but this bird here is not a whippoorwill. This is actually a... Um, a uh, common nighthawk, which is related to the whippoorwill. They look very similar. Uh, I hear stories, people of hearing whippoorwills at night over in Urbana. I've never seen one myself, but common nighthawks I've seen flying. Hard to get pictures of because they often fly around after sunset. Uh, they usually sleep in trees. And luckily I got this one when it was kind of getting ready to settle in for the, for the day. Uh, common red pole, uncommon bird here. It's an Arctic, uh, kind of an Arctic finch. Uh, this is actually a kinglet. This is a yellow crowned kinglet. It's got a yellow crown on it. We've got a horned lark here in the winter. Lap, uh, <clears throat> Lapland longspur. This here is a very cool in the woodpecker family. This is actually a, uh, um, oh my gosh. Why is it, this is a common bird that I normally know very well. Northern flicker. Oh. Some of these birds I know really well, and they're my favorite birds, and I forget them when I'm giving a talk. Uh, anyway, this is a very gorgeous bird. Uh, when they spread their wings out, you can see a little bit on their tail here. It's got yellow, bright yellow on it. Um, we've got a northern mockingbird, so I was wrong. I did have a mockingbird in the picture. I haven't seen too many around here, but they are around. Yeah, I think they're more common down south. So uh, if you go down to like Tennessee, southern Indiana, southern Illinois, you'll, you're more likely to see mockingbirds, but they do come up here sometimes. Uh, this is the only shrike that I've seen. There's two different shrike. This is a northern shrike. I saw this on the Parkland campus last year. Um, there's also a loggerhead shrike. I've never seen a loggerhead shrike. Ring-necked pheasants, not native. They're introduced, but they're still cool birds. Um, this is a ruby-crowned kinglet. Uh, you don't usually see the ruby crown unless they get worked up, and then they'll actually spread their feathers up here to get this bright ruby red-colored spot on top. A snow bunting, not a common bird. I've only ever seen them a couple times. Turkeys, native to the area. 
that's all my pictures that I had planned. So I actually did get through all the pictures and we might actually have time for some questions and stuff. That's good. I was hoping that I wouldn't have time to even get through all my pictures. That's good. I did want to highlight for those of you that uh, maybe aren't birders yet, or you want to get into birding or find out how to get started in birding. There's some resources here. Number one here, and keep in mind this talk is going to be recorded so you'll be able to come back and see this slide and I think they're going to share this in the chat as well. Uh, the panelists will uh, some of these resources but uh, uh, all my Flickr uh, pictures you can get online they're free. Um, I mix in, you know, it's mostly bird pictures that I do in wildlife, so it's not just going to be bird pictures, And but uh, you're never going to see rude pictures or anything like that on my on my Flickr page, but uh, if you want to see all the, all the pictures that I take, uh, here's my Flickr link. Um, Champaign County Audubon Society, including an email, that my, it's called Bird Notes. Uh, this is a, a good way to get started. Um, anytime the Audubon Society has announcements or anything like that, or they announce that there's a bird in the area that people might be interested in seeing, it's an email list that you can subscribe to uh, to then find out uh, about that bird. So I recommend you go there. It's You have to subscribe to it though. And um, so go to the Champaign County Audubon Society website to do that and to hear more about their events. There's a lot of Facebook pages. I've only highlighted a few that I belong to. Uh, this is a really good place to go if you're trying to learn about birds because there are now a lot with digital cameras being everywhere. There are a lot of people that take bird pictures now. And all you have to do is just go to these Facebook pages, join these groups, and you will see some of the birds in the area and eventually it will help you learn the birds you know to look for. And so CU Bird Nerds is one of the newer groups, uh, Champaign Urbana Bird Nerds. So it's kind of a less formal group. Uh, um, so if you're more from the Champaign-Urbana area, that's a good one to go to. South Central Illinois, they tend to be centered more down near Charleston, but uh, it's kind of, it's not strict. Um, so you can cross post to there as well. Uh, Illinois Birding Network is statewide, but it does tend to have a lot of Chicago birding people on there. Birding Illinois is similar. They're, these are kind of sister groups to each other. Um, I think of both of these as being kind of Northern Illinois centric, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, um, you can post from anywhere in Illinois. JWP Audubon is another group. This one's more around the Bloomington area. So uh, these are all free. You can join them if you're on Facebook. Uh, feel free to search for these and uh, you can find them and subscribe. It's a great way to learn how to uh, um, get, get started in birding, get opinions. Um, if you take your own pictures and you're not sure what it is, sometimes those groups can help you identify them. Let's see, did I have anything else? No, I think that was, that was my last slide. So I got through all my slides. I can't believe it. So, um, see, there's something that popped up in Q&A. Uh, so I only see one question here from Ellie. If you only had one afternoon this spring to go birding, where would you choose to go and why? Um, honestly, for, let, me, let me tell you, I am a lazy birder, okay? I, I do not get into birding as, as much as some other people do. There are people that actually like to travel long distances to go see rare birds. They will travel across state lines, I tend to be very lazy. I'm more interested in things that are local that you can see around you if you look for them. But there are some people that are much more adventurous than me. A lot of people on these birding groups, you know, they'll, they'll actually fly to, you know, these are the people that go to jungles, they'll fly to other states, things like that. I will look for birds if I'm in those states happenstance, but uh, I will rarely travel really far uh, for a bird. Um, but if I go locally, some of the best places to go, especially in the spring, is Busey Woods and Crystal Lake Park. Honestly, that's where you'll get a lot of these warblers that are really pretty to, to kind of that, that come through. It's kind of an island in the middle of the corn. And um, uh, they actually appreciate all the trees and everything that's there because most of the bugs that they eat are going to be on the leaves of those trees. So that's honestly a really good place to go. Um, so somebody says that in wet fields, I frequently see large flocks of mostly white birds that look like seagulls. What might they be? They Actually, they could very well be that. Um, the white birds you're going to see in the area are often going to be either really big, in which case they might be like a great egret. They're going to be a goose, you know, like a snow goose, but you're not going to see that usually during the wet season. You're going to more likely see that during the snowy seasons. Uh, but we actually, especially in the spring and the fall, we get a lot of gulls. And if you're near any kind of wet fields, things like that, you can actually see well, they're not really seagulls. They're you know often ring-billed gulls. There's different types of gulls though. That's an area that I'm not, since there's not a lot of water around here, I have to drive to water. About the furthest I've driven is Lake Charleston, which is about an hour and a half south of here. No, 
it's it's about an hour south uh south of here uh, i've been down there quite a few times and uh i need to spend more time down there because i'm starting to run out of birds that i can see locally so i need to branch out and if i want water birds of any type i need to go where there's more water lake charleston is a decent sized body of water if you're looking for that kind of bird so partially an answer to the previous question where would i go for birds eventually it gets to the point what kind of birds are you looking for because there's, there's going to be different birds in different habitats. We've actually got a surprising number of habitats all around the Champaign area. You've got wetland areas like the St. Joseph wetlands. You've got Lake Charleston if you want bigger bigger water that's within quick, relatively quick driving distance. Surprisingly, a little ponds or, you know, and apartments will attract a lot of these birds too, briefly anyway. They don't stick around long periods often, but uh, uh, they, they kind of stop by on their way through. Uh, but ring-billed gulls are quite possibly what you've been seeing. Do you ever photograph at night or is flash photography too much of an issue for capturing the birds? I do not. Um, I have to admit, um, nighttime photography is very difficult and often you need a much longer exposure to pick things up. If I'm taking pictures at night, it's my astronomy hobby that's kicking in and I will actually have my camera mounted on a tripod taking 20 to 30 second exposures or tracking for several minutes on a tracking drive that I have. Um, bird pictures, you know, animals, they move. And it's really hard to get pictures of birds in low light conditions unless you're doing something like infrared photography or night, you know, night vision type photography or something like that through binoculars or something like that. Uh, trying to take regular light photography at night's really not, it's not that realistic. Uh, cameras just aren't set up to do it. Um, the best I've gotten is very well after sunset, light hadn't completely disappeared. I've turned the camera settings up to their full gain and uh, tried to take some pictures of some herons that were perched in a tree and was surprised how well it does. But the problem is the pictures get really, really grainy when you do that. So hey Jeff, there's one yeah. in the chat that um, I was hoping you could get to. Um, this is actually from Peggy Hernandez. So ah, okay. Hi Peggy. Um, Hi, Peggy. What's your snowy owl trick? She says she's not into driving for hours and getting lucky to stop. <laughs> I, I have never found a snowy owl on my own. Like I said, there's, there's groups like Bird Notes and some of these Facebook groups. Often other people are more adventurous and less lazy than me are out before I am. And they will post the presence of such a bird and then we will go out looking for it. So if we get cooped up in the house in the winter and we just want to get out of the house for a while, but it's too cold to walk around, we might get online and see if anybody's reported a snowy owl on any of these groups and then we'll drive to it. Um, but they are not very common. Uh, there's no way to predict whether a snowy owl will be in the area. Um, um, actually, I'm gonna let's see, get out of my, how do I do this? I need to get out, there we go. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna go to my Flickr page and let's see my photo stream and I'll show you some of the recent pictures that I've been able to get. Um, like I said, they're not all birds. Here's a possum that was in our backyard. So <laughs> I enjoy wildlife of about any kind of, as long as it's not doing damage to my house anyway. Um, so a lot of birds, we've got some bald eagles. This is a snowy owl that has been seen, or I, I, I think it's gone by now. I'm not positive about that, but it's stuck around. They don't normally stick around this. You know, you, they're usually here for a day or two and then they're gone. This one stuck around for almost a month south of Sydney, um, which is southeast of Urbana. And, um, it was surprisingly cooperative. And I just drove out the county roads where they said it was there. And you look around, you look for white things sitting out in the middle of cornfields. Often, more often than not, they're a plastic bag. Uh, that's why uh, birders tend to hate plastic bags because they get confused for snowy owls and they get excited. And then it turns out it's just a, uh, a plastic bag. Um, but they're actually quite large birds. Uh, this one was quite often seen up on the power poles. So, um, they actually hunt day and night. They're from the Arctic, so they're not used to the normal 24 hour cycle where they're from. The sun can be up for six months out of the year. And so they kind of hunt whenever they want to. So when they do come down here, uh, you can see them uh, either sleeping or hunting either one during the day. Um, but they're beautiful birds. Um, this is either a, probably a female, but it's hard to tell if it's a juvenile. Uh, adult males are almost pure white. Somebody hinted that this might have been a juvenile male. Females tend to have much darker spots. I didn't hear confirmation on that, um, but I think somebody hinted that it was a juvenile male, um, but surprisingly co cooperative. And I took these pictures from my car window. I didn't even get out of the car. Just pulled off on the side of the road and there he was. 
Um, there's another question here uh, from Joey Anthony uh, says, I didn't realize pheasants weren't native. Have you seen birds that I kind of group with them? Grouse, prairie chicken, bobwhite quail, et cetera. I have never seen a bobwhite quail. That's something that there used to be a lot more of them that they have not. Um, I have never seen a prairie chicken. Those are very endangered. And I think there's only a couple counties in Southern Illinois that still have populations. And I think they're protected down there. So I think you can go out there and they have like bird blinds set up so that you don't spook them. But they're a very odd looking chicken like bird with these big inflatable chest pieces. And they do these weird dances and stuff. They're very cool from the videos I've seen online, but I've never actually ventured to Southern Illinois to try seeing them. Um, but they are native, but they're extremely endangered. Um, but yes, prairie chickens are around, but they're, you have to go to certain counties and go look for them. Um, uh, Bob white quail, like I said, I've never seen one personally. Um, what was the, that was the first bird. What was the first one? Somebody you, you read off. Oh, grouse. A grouse. I've never seen a grouse. Um, I don't know if there's much of a grouse population around here. I think they're more common out West. I could be wrong about that. I, I know in the old days, people used to hunt them more. Um, but I don't know if those were introduced like pheasants were and they just kind of die out eventually until somebody reintroduces them or not. I've never seen a grouse though. Uh, it's not something you're commonly going to see around here. Would love to. I think the one time, the most adventurous I've ever been with my travels has been to Nebraska during the solar eclipse. Me and Waylena went out there and actually we were out there perched uh, on, on our uh, lawn chairs waiting for the eclipse to start and we had a bird fly over and it turned out to be what's called a Swainson's hawk which at first I thought that it was a Northern Harrier because of the way it was flying, but uh, it actually looked like a cross between a Northern Harrier and a uh, red tail hawk. I wasn't sure what it was. It just looked off, but um, I haven't done much traveling to look for birds, but if I'm in an area anyway, for other reasons, I will often look for the birds that are, happen to be there. Got a couple more questions. Um, two from Kathleen. Kathleen first asked in the chat, have you noticed any of these populations decline and then they also asked, how can we help these bird populations? I, I have not noticed the bird decline because like I said, I've only been getting, I've only gotten into birding in the last 10 years and that's only here. Um, I hear a lot about it. I know that there are certain birds that over the decades, they have decreased. Some of the warblers that I've seen used to be far more common in this area than now. Um, I personally, during the time that I've been observing have not personally witnessed the decline themselves. Um, I've seen birds that are less common. I've heard that they maybe were more common in the past, but I personally have not seen them. And related to the question, how can we help these bird populations? Um, native, if you're going to plant things around your property, this is the same thing that's true with butterflies and things like that. Try to plant native varieties of things, native plants, fruiting trees, things like that. Uh, a lot of the birds that are from this area are used to doing that. And when everything gets cut down to make corn, uh, cornfields, a lot of the native uh, food plots disappear with it. So if you can create little islands, like I said earlier, uh, Busey Woods tends to be kind of like an island in the middle of the corn. Um, if you can plant food plots along the way, you might get lucky and attract some of these birds that are that are looking for their, their original native food sources. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of native berries, things like that. The problem is that a lot of these things aren't things like like butterflies, you know, people talk about the monarch butterflies and how they, they like milkweed. A lot of people don't like milkweed. Farmers will often try to eradicate it because it spreads so much, but it's kind of eradicated their natural food source. And as a result, they've seen monarch butterflies decline. Same thing kind of with birds. Uh, if you get rid of the native food sources, the food sources disappear. Um, a lot of the birds that migrate through here that I'm familiar with are insectivores. So they go where the bugs are, but the bugs will often eat the plants. So if you kill the plants that host the bugs, the birds don't have their food source. So it's, it's, the whole, it's the whole chain. So often the best thing you can do is probably plant the native food sources uh, of the, well, either of the bird itself in the case of some fruit trees um, or the insects that often eat the leaves of those trees. You might attract some of those birds. Um, but I don't follow the ecology that close. So I'm probably not the best person to ask, but um, um, some of the groups that I, I've mentioned might have opinions more on detailed on that. Yeah. So Jeff, where are some of the other areas that you look for for these birds? Where, where uh, There's a question, where can these birds most commonly be found? You've mentioned Kaufman Lake. Yeah, so um, a number of the Meadowbrook. sites, Meadowbrook Park, Busey Woods, uh, Crystal Lake Park, 
Uh, Robert C. Porter Park is a great place on the southwest side of town if you want grassland kind of like traditional like before we populated the area you want to know what birds were in the area. There's so much grass and wildflowers out there that you get a lot of dick sissels and grassland type birds out there. Uh, not an exciting variety usually, but if you want dick sissels and that type of thing you can go out there. Um, a lot of the parks around town, especially the ones in Urbana, Urbana's parks tend to be a little bit naturey more so than the Champagne parks, but even small in-town parks like Robeson Park, which is actually in our neighborhood. I've walked to it. I've ridden my bike to it. It's a small little park over by Robeson School in town. It's got a creek that runs through it. And every spring I will go there and you will see, because they usually clean out the weeds on, the, on one side, the other side is completely covered in trees and shrubs. You can stand on one side of the creek, look across the creek and see all the warblers and, and stuff that are in those bushes eating the bugs. Uh, you'll also get black crowned night herons there. I've seen those every spring. It's surprising how many birds, if you look for them, just go to where the native areas are. I tend to find that uh, you get more interesting variety if you're somewhat near a creek or, or water of some type, you get more variety, in my opinion. But there are birds that, you know, aren't really water birds, and you'll see some variety out there too. So you've been to Muhammad, you've got Lake been of the Woods. Muhammad, we've got Lake got... of the Woods. Uh, let's see, where else have we been? Um, St. Joe Wetlands, I, I mentioned that before. Um, let's see, within the There's area. that other park in Muhammad as well. Um, River Bend. River Bend. On, on, on the it. south end of town, I think there's uh, eagles that I don't know if they nest there. They definitely hang out there. There's definitely eagles nesting on the north side of Muhammad. They might be nesting on uh, the south side as well. I don't think I've ever seen the nest there, though. Um, but mm -hmm. River Band often will uh, uh, attract some interesting water birds. Um, what about that area with the walkways, um, Olympian Drive? Yes. Um, if you know where St. Thomas More School is on the north side of Champaign, there is an area there just south of St. Thomas More uh, schools that's got several ponds there. It's kind of an undeveloped area, except that there's sidewalks and grass and then those ponds. And that's about it. No buildings. Um, that's actually turned out, even though it's undeveloped and nothing's actively going on there, it's a great area to walk. And there's a lot of great grassland type birds that show up there. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually a surprisingly nice uh, area to go for birds. Uh, let's see, where else? What am I, what am I forgetting? Um, You've been finding good stuff over by Carl at the Fields, right? Carl at the Fields, sometimes that's a new area. It's over there by Curtis Road and um, I-57 Interchange. They've got some small ponds there. I've seen some birds there. They've got those little ponds that will, uh, cormorants. I've actually had cormorants show up there. Not much beyond that, but it is an interesting area to check. They're so new that I want to keep checking back there because um, the field uh, puddles think, in that area yes, are very. That's, I mentioned earlier in the yeah. talk when I said that there were some flooded cornfields near the corner of Curtis Road and Staley, and there's a church there, and just just west of that church, right along Curtis Road, there's a flooded cornfield, and that's actually not far from Carl at the Fields. That whole area out there, southwest of town. Um, check out the, the fields and everything like that. Surprisingly, driving out in the winter around the rural roads, don't get stuck in the snow. That has happened to us. Um, we actually were out looking and found a bald eagle and pulled off to the side of the road and uh, ended up having to have some local people help us uh, out of the snow. <laughs> so just be aware if you're gonna drive the country roads, make sure you're equipped to deal with it in case you get, get, get your car stuck. Um, Anyway, uh, rural, rural roads is often sometimes uh, in the winter, just a great place to go. Uh, when, when the fields are down, a lot of the raptors will often come in and take advantage of those open fields to then fly in and look for mice. So you'll often see a lot of uh, red tail hawks, things like that out there in the winter, just driving around the country, country roads. Uh, the, the, I, I mentioned uh, several times the swine farms there close to the Yahoo offices. That is an amazingly great place to go, but don't park on the streets, the police will you're, you know, you're not legally allowed to park on the streets there. There's parking lots nearby. You can park over by the uh, John Deere. There's a John Deere building nearby there. If you're going to park, park there and walk. Um, it's not that far of a walk, but uh, don't, don't get yourself a ticket for parking in a place you're not supposed to be along those streets there. But um, um, yeah. We do have one hand raised. Um, um, sure. Let's I'll see. let Eleanor uh, go ahead and talk because they've had their hand up this whole time. Eleanor, try to unmute yourself and ask the question that you had. All right, well, Eleanor is working on that. I'm also going to allow Steve Mullen to talk because Steve had put some of his comments into the chat, but okay. I'm gonna let 
it might be that his daughter's Kate is, is wanting to uh, share this information. Okay. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead. Mm -hmm. Are you unmuted? Go uh, ahead. So, uh, so, yeah. So, it's not much of questions, but I uh, saw uh, several owls sometimes uh, going back to school, perched on a branch, uh, sleeping uh, uh, very early in the morning. Where do you, where do you live? Uh, Urbana. Okay, Urbana actually has a lot of trees over there, and some friends of mine, there's a, with, because of all the trees, owls like trees. And so there's both red, uh, I'm sorry, great horned owls and barred owls are probably the most common, but there's actually other owls too. There's screech owls that hang out over there. So there's yeah. actually at least three different types. Uh, probably what you saw were probably either a barred owl or a great horned owl. Those I tend to be more common. Owl because uh, I was uh, I was too far away and my eyes were kind of blurry in the morning <laughs> and uh, I didn't have a picture camera. I am not a morning person. There are sometimes we've actually driven up to Danville and tried to be up to Heron Park on the north side of the Vermilion River uh, at sunrise. Sunrise is a great time to go birding because birds, especially the ones that migrate, go after bugs. And often in the morning, they're closer to the ground and the birds are going to go where the bugs are. Yeah. As, the, as the day goes on, the bugs get higher in the trees and the birds get harder to see. The problem is I'm an astronomer by background and I'm used to staying up late. I'm not used to getting up early. So mm -hmm. morning, even though that's the best time for birding, I'm often, it's hard for me to get up and going that early in the morning. <laughs> Part of my lazy birding that yeah. I mentioned. Before. And there, there's a... a a colonel that keeps coming back in our backyard. I'm not sure if it's a, uh, a, the exact same one or if it's a, a different one. Cardinals are starting to get very loud. They're starting to sing their spring songs. I've yeah. noticed in the last couple of weeks, and, they started to get very and loud. The squirrels are so annoying. They're eating all of the bird seeds. Yeah, my house too. We have about five squirrels in my small little backyard and they go through our seed way faster than the birds do. I don't, I've tried about everything I can to keep them off and uh, all I can do is, you know, discourage them, but I can't completely stop it. It's kind of an unsolved, yeah. unsolved problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, we keep seeing some heron at Crystal Lake Park. Dad, what is it? What kind of? great blue. And we see great blue heron several times at uh, Crystal Lake Park. And one I've, time we saw it glide through uh, the uh, lake. Yeah, but there's, a, there's actually green herons there too, but they're much harder to see. Really? Great blue herons are more common. They're bigger, they're easier to see. But the green herons, we've seen them on a number of occasions out there during our public bird walks. On a normal year, uh, the Champaign Urbana, I'm sorry, the, the Champaign Audubon Society, um, they actually have public bird walks 7.30 morning on Sundays during migration. They would normally start in March, but because of COVID, the last, you know, all of last year, and it's continuing through this year, uh, they're kind of discouraging public gatherings. You're, you're welcome to go out there and walk yourself, but um, they're unfortunately not doing that. That's often a great place to learn birding is to attend one of the public bird walks. Um, so keep an eye on that, you know, with any luck, maybe we'll have them in the fall, yeah. I don't know, but um, in the spring, I don't think we're planning to do any of those. And there, and in our backyard a few years ago, uh, we had uh, a nest and some uh, robins in it. And on our neighbor's uh, little window frame, there was a, a robin's nest and we got to saw the mother sitting on the nest. Nice, robins are often a bird you'll see doing that. Yeah, they, they like to put that we get we get a lot of house sparrows around our house we don't get as many robins although we do see some uh, we get a lot of house uh, I'm sorry house finches uh, mm -hmm. but house finches house sparrows things like that they'll often uh, yeah. make, make nests on your porch sometimes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my my cat Bilbo is crazy about those birds and squirrels and one time mom saw a blue jay at work uh-huh blue jays are noisy birds thank you bye thank bye you. you're welcome all right. So, folks, uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Um, if you feel more comfortable speaking, uh, you can uh, raise your hand and I will be happy to unmute you so that you can ask uh, Jeff a question that way if you'd like. Okay.
Well, all right. Jeff, thank you so much for giving this presentation. It was great. It was beautiful. And uh, I think uh, everybody was really happy to see all of this. This was fantastic. A lot um, of birds to study. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's almost as if there's more birds than there are mammals or something. Uh, so anyways, uh, folks, uh, our, we have one more Kaler Science Lecture for this academic year, and that will be essentially, uh, gosh, is it exactly four weeks from now? It probably is. On April 2nd, uh, we will be um, hosting Daniel Andruchik, um, and I will find out how to correctly pronounce his name in the next four weeks anyways. And he is going to give a lecture on the basics of fusion and the possibility of us potentially in the future uh, harnessing fusion as a power source uh, for humanity. Uh, so you're going to learn a little bit about that at that talk on, uh, at 7 p.m. on, again, April 2nd. All right. But thank you all once again for attending uh, this evening's Kaler Science Lecture. Um, and uh, we hope you have a good rest of your evening for those of you who are taking off. For the rest of you, we're going to hit stop on the recording and we will start again where Waylena will be hosting Prairie Skies Spotlight on exoplanets. So you've been seeing all these birds here on Earth. Well, now we're going to see what's lying outside of Earth and outside of our solar system. Thanks again.